Thanks very much, Kyle, and, and thank you to CETA for inviting me to speak today. And uh, can I also recognise the traditional owners of the land on which we stand and their elders past and present? Uh, and my good friend, Cathy O'Toole, the, the federal member here for Herbert, and uh, the incredible uh, mayor of Townsville, Jenny Hill, um, and all of the councillors and state members that are here as well, and particularly the, the business community, the, the business leadership of Townsville is well represented in this room and can I thank you for, for coming along. Today you're going to hear some of my thoughts a couple of months into this job but I'd appreciate the opportunity to get to know you a little bit more and to hear your thoughts. We're in opposition, we've got 18 months, two years before the next federal election and I think a lot of the things that we need to do as a party to make sure that we're competitive at the next election is making sure we've got the right plans for this region and the best place to get them is from you rather than from up here at, on this stage at this lectern. I'm, um, I'm not from Townsville, I'm a boy from the western suburbs of Sydney but like a, a lot of Australians I do have a connection to this place and I thought I'd start there because on Christmas Day in 1942, 75 years ago, a boy from Sydney arrived here in Townsville. He came on a military plane from PNG and he carried with him a piece of shrapnel in his stomach. He got that from a, a Japanese mortar that exploded near him on the first day of the Battle of the Beachheads, those battles that took place on the northern side of PNG after Kokoda, at a battle called San Ananda. And that boy was just 19. He'd just turned 19 a couple of weeks before. That boy was my grandfather. His name was Jack Clare. And while he was here, while he was uh, being operated on and recuperating, he met a girl, a girl called Jean Campbell. And she was from relatively just down the road, a place called Rockhampton, <laughs> relatively speaking. She was part of what they called the WAX, the Women's Auxiliary Corps. Uh, you've got to remember that um, we're talking about a time where only a couple of months beforehand Townsville had been bombed three times by the Japanese and she was part of a, a, a group of young women that were being trained to use all of the weapons that would be needed if the Japanese landed and attacked here. That young woman, Jean Campbell, became his wife and became my grandmother. Townsville uh, is a very different place today than the Townsville that existed 75 years ago when they fell in love. 75 years ago, Townsville had a population, or a, at least a permanent population, of 30,000. There are about another 90,000 people here in uniform at the time, and I don't need to tell you this, you know this, it was uh, a major military base. That's why the Japanese bombed it three times in 1942. Today it's still a major military base, but the population's a lot bigger, now almost 200,000. And it's the home of two world-class universities, a world-beating rugby league team, and soon, hopefully soon, a first-rate stadium for them to play in. But Townsville faces another threat. This is what I want to focus on today. And it's something that hasn't been this bad here in Townsville since well before World War II, since the Great Depression, and that's unemployment. And it's not just a problem here, it's a problem that you'll see manifested right throughout central and northern Queensland. Back when my grandparents were here, about one in three Queenslanders lived in Brisbane. That number's now changed, uh, that proportion's now changed. Now you'll find that one in every two Queenslanders, one in every two people who live in this enormous state live in one place, and that's Brisbane. And just like other big cities here and around the world, Brisbane has a gravitational pull, sucking people in from the regions and drawing people in for one reason, one particular reason, and that's employment, because of jobs. Big cities, at least now in the, the start of the 21st century, are where most of the jobs are being created. Here's a statistic I think that, that might surprise you. In the last 10 years, half the jobs created in Australia have been created within a two kilometre radius of the CBD of Sydney and Melbourne. Half the jobs 
created in Australia in the last 10 years within a two kilometre radius of Sydney and Melbourne. Now that brings with it, I can tell you as a, as a, a bloke from Sydney, it brings with it plenty of challenges, brings, brings plenty of jobs, but it also brings ruinous traffic congestion and ridiculous housing prices. On the weekend, I, I was talking about this on, on telly on the weekend, the Daily Telegraph on Saturday had as its front page story the fact that in some suburbs in Sydney, housing prices are going up by $2,000 a day. So with all of this sucking in of people and population, enormous job growth, but it does have the consequences of housing prices going up and traffic congestion. Brisbane's seen the same, not on that scale, but Brisbane house prices have risen by about 12.5% in the last five years. Now what I want to do is compare and contrast what you're seeing in Sydney and Brisbane and what you're seeing here and in northern Queensland. In places like Gladstone and Mackay, house prices have fallen in the past few years by about 20%. So in Sydney, some places, house prices going up by two grand a day. Gladstone, a drop of 20%. In Rockhampton, they've fallen by 10%. Here in Townsville, by 8%. Even more worrying is what's happening to unemployment. And if you saw the Courier Mail last week, they did a big spread on this earlier in the week. It revealed that in the last year, in the last 12 months, 13 and a half thousand new jobs have been created in Brisbane. But over the same time, in the last 12 months, we've seen 43,300 jobs lost in the rest of Queensland. So more jobs created in Brisbane, more jobs being lost outside of Brisbane. When the GFC hit Australia in 2009, 2010, it hit places like Townsville hard and unemployment went up. You saw that in Townsville, Cairns, other, other, other parts along central and northern Queensland. But it's worse today. Unemployment is higher in Townsville today than it was, was then, a lot worse. And I've got, I'm going to follow Michael and show a graph. Hang on, I'll go the other way. There it is there. So global financial crisis hits, unemployment rises to around about 8.7% in Townsville. The blue line is unemployment, the red line is youth unemployment. Then it drops down, then it keeps growing up and up from 2012, 13, 14, 15, 16, 17. This is not the CBD, this is a broader Townsville region, but the same data is true if you, if you drop down to the CBD. 8.7 during the GFC, 11.2 today. You know the reasons for some of that. We can thank Mr Palmer for some of that. We can thank the end of the mining construction boom as jobs taper off in construction, in mining and LNG as well. And you see the same story play out in other parts of central and northern Queensland. That's Mackay. That's Gladstone and Rockhampton. Not as fierce, not as, not as ferocious a climb, but you can still see it going up. Now in Cairns, you also see the same pattern, but you see youth unemployment rising at an exponential level. It's gone up. Let me show you Cairns. Youth unemployment, the red line, has gone from 8% 10 years ago to 26% today, more than tripled. It's, it's also youth unemployment is now more than double what it was during the height of the GFC. Now, Michael, in your slides a moment ago, you talked about the elephant and you saw average wage growth for the very rich and the very poor and that dip in the middle, that hollowing out of the middle class, middle class and working class people who haven't received an income increase. I want to sort of build on, on that point and show how it's different in the regions to the big cities. Because in all of these places that I've, I've highlighted on the slides, Cairns, Townsville, Gladstone, Mackay, Rockhampton, not only will you see unemployment and youth unemployment going up, you see one other thing. And that is that wages in those regions are lower today than they were five years ago. And this is, I, I think, the really important point here. Because it's not just people who can't find a job, and there's lots of them who are feeling the pinch, but there's a lot of people feeling the pinch. Because the amount of money in their pocket for many people 
is less today than it was five or ten years ago. And the same thing's not happening in Brisbane or Sydney or Melbourne. I'll show you, I'll show you Brisbane. So with Brisbane, you see the opposite. You see unemployment going up during the GFC and now lower than it was then today. I don't have a slide for it, but if I was to bring up the slides of growth in average income or growth in household income, you'd see average income going up progressively through this time scale. So unemployment is going up in the regions and incomes are going down. And in big cities like Brisbane, and it's not just Brisbane, it's Sydney and Melbourne as well, you're seeing unemployment coming down and you're seeing average wages going up. Now this is what I think helps to explain the re-emergence of one nation and the emergence of some of those, those extreme right parties that are saying there's got to be a better way. In many parts of Australia, but particularly in the regions, people are feeling like they're standing still or they're going backwards, that they've got less money in their pocket today than they did before. Housing prices are going down and unemployment's going up. And if they do have a job, they're probably being paid less today than they were five or 10 years ago. And they're worried about whether they're gonna have a job tomorrow. There's also a lot of people that are working part-time that wanna work full-time. They want more hours and they can't get them. That's why there's a lot of people that are stressed and angry and anxious and suspicious. Everything seems unfair, the whole system seems to be rigged against them. And in desperation, they're voting for someone else, for something else, for anything else, hoping that things will change. And it's not just Australia where you can see this, you can see, see the same thing happening overseas. In the UK last year, the POMs voted to leave the European Union, but they didn't all vote for Brexit. In London, the big city, they voted to stay. It was the regional cities that voted to leave. In, in, in London, just like Brisbane, you'll find that unemployment is lower today than it was 10 years ago. But in places in the northeast, like Newcastle or Sunderland or Durham, unemployment's higher. Coal mines have shut, thousands of people have lost their jobs in oil and gas. Skilled, uh, skilled steel and car manufacturers have laid off hundreds of workers. And these are the places that voted for Brexit. You go to the US and you'll see exactly the same phenomenon playing out. Unemployment in the US is lower today than it was during the GFC. But most Americans are still earning less today than they were when Lehman Brothers collapsed eight and a half years ago. And once again, the pain of all of this is not being felt evenly. So you go to a place like Manhattan and you'll find that the median household income is now 18% higher than it was a decade ago. But go to Detroit, Michigan, and it's 10% lower. You see the same problem in places like Ohio and Wisconsin, what's called the Rust Belt of the United States. And guess what? They're the places that voted for Donald Trump. Actually, they didn't vote for Trump, they didn't vote at all. A lot of people decided not to vote. These are places that voted for Obama in 2008 and 2012. Last year in November, a lot of white working class Democrat voters in these states decided either to not turn up and not vote or to vote for a third party. And that's what tipped the balance and meant that Donald Trump won those states and ultimately became the President of the United States. The point I'm trying to make is this. We are not one nation where everyone has the same opportunities. Life is very different depending upon where you live. And that divide is only getting bigger. And politicians ignore that at their peril. Now I know I've, I've painted a fairly bleak picture, so let me try and even the score a bit. I was here in Townsville in October last year when uh, Sun Metals made that terrific announcement about the expansion of the refinery. And if that comes off, that's going to mean an extra 100 jobs here in Townsville. The Adani project, as everybody knows here, will be an even bigger boon 
for Townsville and the whole region and create thousands of jobs, a lot of them high-tech, high-skilled jobs based right here in town. I was talking to Jenny about this only the other day and she made the point to me that it is creating, has created already, a new sense of optimism in Townsville. When construction of the stadium kicks off, it'll be another massive jobs generator. The key here, of course, is making sure that the head contractor employs local subcontractors and local tradies. The $1.6 billion port expansion will create another 100 construction jobs. Yesterday's Tiger Air announcement is another example of good news that will create more jobs here in town. A few weeks ago, BHP also mentioned that they're recruiting another 270 people here in Townsville, but right across the region as they expand work at Peak Downs and Siraji Mine, the Bowen Basin. I guess, Michael, this is an, another example of commodity prices going, going up and you're seeing more work in the region as, as a result of that. The whole rise of Asia uh, and three billion people just to our north who want the same sort of things that we want, the same sort of food, the same sort of health care, the same education opportunities, the same sort of holidays, creates great opportunities for the whole country, but in particular for central and northern Queensland for our farmers, for our universities, and for our, our tourist centres. And I want to give the State Government a plug. I think they're doing some great things. They've, they've put about $5 billion into more than 80 infrastructure projects in North Queensland that will create more local jobs, like the upgrade of the Townsville to Mount Isa rail line. The announcement which I, I saw when I was in Cairns on Tuesday of $200 million for regional councils for 700 odd shovel ready projects is another great example of a government not mucking around. This was announced only a couple of months ago. Jenny, correct me if I'm wrong, but I think councils only had a month to tell the state government what they would spend the money on. Now the decision's been made, the money will go out and if it's done properly, it'll create up to 6,000 jobs around and across regional Queensland. Now the area of Northern Australia policy is one where there is a lot of bipartisanship between the two major parties in Canberra. Both parties understand how important it is. Both parties have tried with some success and some failure over more than a century to help make this happen. And I think that's important. The business community thrives on bipartisanship, wants to see the two major parties try and work together in the best interest of the country. And so you will always hear me, me talk about the good relationship I have with the Minister for Northern Australia, how we can pick up the phone and talk to each other and work things through. But as a, as a person who aspires to hold that job, I've also got to hold the government to account and say, this is where you can do things better. And there are areas where I think the government has either dropped the ball or they've been too slow to act, where they're mucking around with things that could have been done quicker. A good example of that is what's happening at the moment with work being done by the Productivity Commission. Uh, just Late last year, middle of December, there was this report on the front page of The Australian. Coalition in bid to win disaffected voters at risk of drifting to one nation. The story says, Scott Morrison has directed the Productivity Commission to identify as a matter of urgency the hardest hit regions and towns most at risk of job losses and economic decline as mining investment ends. I guess my response to that is you don't have to be Nostradamus to work out where those regions are. I've just spent five minutes or so explaining why central and northern Queensland fits that bill. But that's work that's currently going on. We're supposed to see the results of that in April and potentially the government's response to that in the budget. They also released an infrastructure plan late last year done by Infrastructure Australia called the Infrastructure Priority List. Another good piece of work, a good organisation that was set up uh, when we were last in government. But my major criticism of that is there's not one high priority infrastructure project in that report north of Rockhampton in a region suffering from high unemployment. I make the same criticism of the NAIF, the Northern Australia Infrastructure Facility. Again, this is an area where you've got both sides of politics saying this is a terrific idea. $5 billion to invest in the north, create more jobs, create more businesses. 
My criticism of the NAIF is it was announced in May of 2015, so we're on the verge of two years. Of that $5 billion, not one cent has been spent so far. It's just taking too long. Then there's the cost of energy and the availability of water. And Townsville knows this better than perhaps most of the regional capitals, most of the regional cities in Northern Australia. Townsville is on, Jenny, I'm, I'm right here, level three water restrictions at the moment. And there's a lot of work going on, good work being done through Townsville Enterprise as well as the state government. The key thing here that everyone who lives and works in Townsville wants to know is what the result of that work's going to be and what's the action that's going to come out of it. The federal government's also created a bit of stress lately for farmers both near Rockhampton as well as Charters Towers. I spent a good part of yesterday out at Charters Towers talking to the farmers that would be affected by this, by the potential compulsory acquisition of land as part of the expansion of high range for the deal with the Singapore government and the Singapore Defence Force. The government's now said that they won't compulsorily acquire that land. That's good news, it's a, it's, a, it's a great win for the farmers and for the affected local community. We still don't have the revised master plan for that region to know exactly what land the government wants to take. I also want to spend a bit of time just talking about the impact of certain government decisions on regions and use the NBN as an example here. Before the last election, I was the Shadow Minister for Communications. Now, there are some places in Australia that are very lucky. They've already got the NBN and they've got the real version of the NBN, the optic fibre that goes all the way to your business or all the way to your home. A lot of Cairns has got it. Mackay, at least the southern side of Mackay, south of the Pioneer River, has it. But if you don't have it now, you're not going to get it. At least you're not going to get the optic fibre version. You'll get the, the copper version instead. And the impact of that for all Australians, but particularly for people who live in regional Australia, is very significant. The AMA put out a report only a couple of weeks ago that warned that health services in regional and rural Australia could fall behind cities even further than they are now unless doctors and their patients have access to fast and affordable broadband. They surveyed their members, surveyed their, their uh, GPs right across Australia, and for GPs in rural and regional Australia, they said their top priority was faster broadband. This is an area, I talked about bipartisanship, this is an area where the two major parties disagree. The government thinks that fibre to the node or copper is good enough and we don't. It's also an area where an election makes a difference. Because remember, we only lost the last election by a couple of, a couple of seats. If we had won, 38,000 more homes and businesses in the seat of Leichhardt would have got fibre instead of copper. 26,000 more homes and businesses here in Herbert would have got fibre instead of copper. And 12,000 more in Dawson and 16,000 more in Flynn. So don't let anyone tell you that elections don't matter. They certainly did last year for Central and Northern Queensland. The current debate that the Parliament is having about whether we should cut family payments and pensions will also have a very big impact here. The government wants to cut payments to single pensioners by $365 a year and couples by $550 a year. That's money that will come out of the pockets of 12,000 pensioners here in Herbert and 90,000 right across the region. The cuts to families will mean that a family that's got two kids on 65 grand, there's plenty of them here, they'll lose $750 a year. There's over 10,000 in this community. They're not rich families and this money is money that's not not saved, it's money that's spent, usually spent in local businesses, employing local people. So those sort of cuts, if they get through the Senate, will create even more local un unemployment. Right across central and northern Queensland, there's 70,000 families in this situation. The sort of people that are doing it tough that I described before, the sort of people that are thinking about voting for One Nation. And the irony is, if these cuts do get through the parliament, it'll be because of One Nation. Front page of the Oz today, one Nation saying the only problem with these cuts is that they don't go far enough. So the, the point I'd make about One Nation is they pretend to be different, but at least in Canberra there are, there are effectively two Liberal parties. The One Nation's voting with the Coalition 80% of the time. 
There's one other thing where the federal government could do more, and that's on 457 visas. Visas, as you know, that are designed to fill gaps in the workforce. Adani's made the point that they're not going to use 457s, and that's a great thing. We shouldn't be doing that in a region where unemployment is so high. But there's, all, there's still 500 or more workers in the Townsville region on 457 visas. It's an area where it's obvious that something more can be done. And if Labor wins the next federal election, we'll make a number of changes to this system. We'll require, require employers to look for local workers and advertise for local workers for a month instead of five days. And we'll also require companies that employ lots of 457 workers to develop their own training plan to employ and train local workers to replace those overseas workers over time. Just in wrapping up, I also want to just talk quickly about skills. If we're going to close the gap in opportunity and unemployment and standard of living that I've described today between the regions and the cities, skills are a very big part of it. If you go to all the different parts of Australia where unemployment is high, you'll usually find one thing, and that is the percentage of people finishing high school is lower than the national average. That's why Gonski is important. Most of the jobs that will be created, I talked about jobs created in cities earlier, most of the jobs that will be created over the course of the next decade or two will require young people to finish high school and then go on to TAFE or university. And as I've been talking to educators here in Townsville, they've made the point repeatedly to me over the last few days, the proportion of students finishing high school is lower than the national average, the proportion going on to university in TAFE here is lower than you'd find in Brisbane or Sydney. TAFE's also going backwards. We've seen big cuts to it. The number of apprentices being employed over the last few years has fallen significantly. We've got 128,000 fewer apprentices today being trained than there were four years ago. In Townsville, there's over 1,000 fewer apprentices than there were four years ago. And so one of the things we've said is if we win the next election on every major Commonwealth infrastructure project, will make it mandatory that 10% of the people on that job need to be Australian apprentices. This is just the start. I hope I've sort of set the scene for a couple of questions. We've got a lot of work to do over the course of the next 12 months as we develop our policies. And I guess the point I want to leave you is, with is that I want to do that work with you. Um, it's one thing to have the Productivity Commission in Canberra to do this work. I think it's a hell of a lot better to do that work with the people on the ground. Finally, in wrapping up, those two lovebirds from Townsville, they didn't stay in Townsville. Uh, my grandfather convinced Jean to move to Sydney. Uh, when they got there, he, he, he left the army at the end of the war. He became uh, an upholsterer. That business failed, and so he went back into the army, stayed in the army for about 40 years, um, including a tour of, of Vietnam. He, um, he passed away about 20 years ago, 20 years ago this year, but the family still has that little piece of shrapnel that he brought home from Papua New Guinea in, in his stomach. Um, and last October, I was just telling the people at the table, I became a dad for the first time. I was actually in Darwin at the time when my wife rang and said, I'm going into labour, get home. Um, that was at two o'clock in the afternoon. The next plane out of Darwin to Sydney was at 1 a.m that morning. So I spent quite a few nervous hours in Darwin uh, waiting for an aeroplane. It landed in Sydney at 6am, got to the hospital at 6.30 and that little baby was born at 8.10am. At, uh, so I made it by an hour and a half. We named him Jack. Uh, we named him Jack after his great grandfather. And what I hope is that the life he lives is not as dangerous as the life his great grandfather lived. but He'll grow up knowing that if we're going to be successful, it's going to take the same sort of determination and hard work and courage that it took here 75 years ago, and in full knowledge that it's going to take a lot of hard work and determination and support in cash and leadership from a government in Canberra. Thanks very much.